So the third component with our airway is being able to secure it. So when we look at securing the airway, what we're talking about is the patient's tongue. Number one thing that includes the airway, tongue. All right, so that's classic. Somebody who goes truly unresponsive, once that reticular activating system, right, the part of our brain that keeps us awake and alert, when that goes unresponsive, what happens is we lose that muscular tone. So this is where we see the patient go limp, they're dead weight, the tongue, muscle, so now that goes limp and that's where it can fall back and start to include that glottic opening. So it's not that we swallow the tongue, but now as the tongue falls back, it hits that epiglottis with that piece of cartilage, and now that can now either partially or fully occlude that glottic opening. Remember, a glottic opening is that division between the upper and lower airway. So when we start to look at you know, uh, how to manage this airway, when we open it, that does a, a nice job displacing the tongue. The problem is we need something a little bit more to make sure that that tongue stays in the position that we want. So we have two simple adjuncts that we talk about at the BLS level, and we've got our OPA and our NPA. So when we're starting to look at securing this airway, we've already done opening, we've checked for patency, if we needed to suction, we've done that. Now we're on to that third step of securing the First device that we're gonna talk about is an OPA, okay? So the indications for an OPA are patients unresponsive, so if the patient's unresponsive, we already know that they are not in a position to be able to secure that airway. We have to do an intervention to make sure that we can keep that airway secure for them prevent that tongue from falling back. So an OPA stands for an oral pharyngeal airway. Okay, so the OPA, simple adjunct, and what it means by that is it sits above the glottic opening, so it's non-invasive. We're not passing anything into the trachea. So, you know, there's a couple different ways of sizing it. Um, you know, your book will talk about going from, um, you know, the middle of the mouth to the angle of the jaw. The other way is from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the ear. To keep everything nice and consistent, you know, we try to always just have one way instead of teaching you three different ways of how to do everything. So the way that we're gonna teach you is we're going to teach you from the corner of the mouth to the corner of the ear, and we're looking for this to be able to sit appropriately. So we're measuring from that corner to the tip of the ear, and the reason that we're doing that is this is the measurement from where when we place this, this part here is what we call the flange, and we can see that it's got a fenestration. The fenestration is the opening. So when we have this in place, we're gonna ventilate the patient. We can still get air through the opening and around the OPA. So when this flange sits, when we see how this sits, it sits flush to the lips. So when this piece is at the lips, and that's partly why we measure from there, we're looking to just go and be able to secure that tongue from falling back. If the OPA was, was too big, then it would go back and it could actually occlude that airway. If it's too small, it's not gonna do the job intended, so if we incorrectly size it and it's too small, now the tongue could still fall back because it wouldn't be able to hold it in place. So, you know, this is a, a quick sizing. You know, OPAs will show you, you know, they come in all different sizes, so you kind of look, you kind of guesstimate, you measure against, and you make sure that it's appropriate. Again, you wanna make sure, that, you know, as best we can, we get it as accurate as we can. A little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, if they fall in between sizes, you've got to make your, you know, a good clinical judgment as to what you think is going to be best for the patient. So indications, the patient is unresponsive and they need to not have an intact gag reflex. So if they still are kind of semi-conscious and they have that gag reflex, they're still somewhat able to protect their airway. That would not, we would have a contraindication, we would have to move on to our NPA. So indications, the patient is unresponsive, no gag reflex. So if you start to insert it and they start to gag, dry heave, you would remove this, this would not be an appropriate device, okay? So when we go to insert this, again, you know, we're gonna be up at the patient's, you know, the top of the head, we're gonna be at that airway. So we've, we've done, you know, the type of, you know, opening that we needed to. So if we do a head tilt, chin lift, this is where now there's a couple different ways that you can, you know, kind of make sure that this is open when we insert it. You can either do the scissor technique, so you, you'll see that talked about in your book. Um, one of the ways that we teach you when you come to school, so that way it does work, but it also runs a little bit of a risk, because now when you slide your fingers, you potentially could be running it over you know, your patient's teeth. So when we look at this, you know, and if you look at you know, your own teeth and others, they could be chipped, they could be damaged, you could have snaggle puss. Now all of a sudden we've got you know, crazy teeth going on, we have things broken, that can now become an exposure risk, right? So, one of the ways that we'll kind of teach you is kind of this, what we call like a tongue jaw lift. This is where now I've already sized my OPA, I can kind of use it almost as a bite block, right? So what we don't want if this patient is responsive is that they're gonna clamp down on our hand 
you know, because they will break your finger and in some cases, you know, you can get that, you know, stuck in there. So what we want to do, bite block, and then we come and now I've got the tongue and the jaw and this gives me a good grip. So I'm able to come in. Again, two ways to insert this. You'll see, you know, a lot of literature will tell you to come in at 180 degrees. So you start with this facing the, the, the hard palate, the roof of the mouth, and turn it completely till it sits. So this is going to sit over the tongue. Totally appropriate. We kind of teach you to come in at 90 degrees because one of the things is if we start at the top, we now run, we, we've added a risk of nicking the top of that hard palate. Again, the mouth is very vascular. So now if we come in and we, we cause some, you know, tissue damage or bleeding, now we're back to suctioning. So we don't want to do any harm to the patient. We want to make sure that we're using you know, good practice. So both are appropriate. You'll play around in the lab and you're going to find what technique feels most comfortable to you and then that's what you're going to use. So it's not that one's better or worse. You know, for you know, what we're going to show you here, I'm going to show you when we come in. So we've got that head tilt chin lift. We're now coming in. I'm using this as a bite block. I've got a good tongue jaw lift. I'm coming in at 90 degrees, and then I rotate this, and now you can see it sits flush against the patient's lips. 